Okay, thank you for coming today. It's a privilege and an honor to talk to the redoubtable Neil Ferguson about his new book, The Square and the Tower. Uh, Neil is an extraordinary scholar in every sense. I'm very envious of his uh, ability to take on complicated topics, to uh, write about them in ways that don't uh, miss the complexity and yet is accessible. Uh, and he also has a flair for the contrarian, which I admire, and he often and almost always pulls it off. So, and this book is no exception. And um, so, Neil, the book is about, uh, the book opens with a, an overview of network theory, and then it's an extraordinarily ambitious book. It, it aims to basically review history, the history of mankind, through this lens of the, of the, the distinction and the ebb and flow of hierarchies and networks. So is that a good description? And tell us about the book. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you, Jack. It's a great pleasure to be here at uh, Hoover's uh, Washington Outpost. Is that the right term? I think that's and right. And a joy to be on the same stage as, as you, somebody whose work I've, I've long admired and learned from. And I should say one of the shrewdest commentators on contemporary uh, constitutional and political issues uh, in the United States today to be followed on all available media platforms. Thank you. The Square and the Tower is, is an attempt to think differently about history. It's mostly the last 500 years, but there are some excursions into ancient history. And I start with a false dichotomy. It's not, not many books start with a false dichotomy, but I do quite deliberately. And that is a dichotomy between networks and hierarchies. Most people, I think, intuitively have that false dichotomy in their heads. Uh, when I say the square and the tower, meaning the square is where you socialize, where social networks happen, and the tower is where power resides, hierarchically organized, that makes sense, I think, to most people. And most of you in your daily lives will move between the square of your social network, your friends, your family, and there's some org chart in most of our lives. I mean, even the Hoover Institution has an org chart, though it is honored mainly in the breach. So we understand that there are these different modes of operation. And the book starts there and says, well, let's think of history as, in some sense, the interplay of, of social networks and political hierarchies. And then what I try to show using network science as the guide is that that is actually a false dichotomy and that human organizations can be both networks and hierarchies on a continuum and the sweet spot is probably an organization that captures enough hierarchical structure to be viable, to be capable of strategic decision making, but enough network architecture to be responsive uh, and creative. I think it's fair to say, and this is the last point I'll make in this rather long answer, I think it's fair to say that, that the creative impulse in human organizations tends to come from the network side of the organizational spectrum. Uh, the problem about trying to organize the world mainly on the basis of distributed or decentralized networks is that they're very bad at defense. They're very bad at security. Uh, as I like to put it, if you think two-factor authentication is going to make your network secure, I've got a bridge to sell you. So the reason that hierarchical structures tend to dominate the historical narrative is that for most of history, human beings have prioritized security and defense. There are no armies run like Facebook groups. Uh, there's a reason why command structures are so vital to the operation of the military, of any military enterprise. So I think that's a helpful, if somewhat false dichotomy, the, the distinction between the square and the tower. It's intuitive, but the book is supposed to show you that in fact there's a continuum, and we're really talking here about a distinction between hierarchical networks and distributed networks, hierarchically organized or vertically organized forms of network organization and those that are genuinely decentralized where there really isn't any commanding central node. And speaking of uh, um, vertical organization, it's not just armies, it's the state is the ultimate or one of the ultimate Absolutely. vertical organizations and it's largely at least or partly in the business of defense. So before we get to some examples, 
can you just tell us where the, the book uh, suggests that historians have not exclusively but largely seen history through the lens of um, hierarchies? Not not exclusively, but 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 largely. So tell us about that. Uh, why historians have done that, and why this type of history is different. It's a professional deformation that historians tend to go to archives, and archives tend to be produced by hierarchically structured organizations. The state uh, keeps archives for a practical reason. Knowledge is power. It also helps to know what your predecessors did. And so archives arise uh, mainly because vertically structured structures of governance need them. Uh, big corporations also tend to have archive departments. And historians, there are some working historians in the room will know the magnetic power of a well-ordered archive. <laughs> but if you base most of your research in those archives, you will see the world from a hierarchical perspective. You will see the world the way the bureaucracy saw it. For me, it was a kind of moment of enlightenment early in my career. I was trying to write the history of the German hyperinflation of the early 1920s. That was my doctoral dissertation topic. And I was sitting in the Hamburg State Archives looking through the bureaucracy's documents. And the hyperinflation was not there. Because the bureaucracy of the Hamburg State in the early 1920s just carried on as if everything was normal. The only clue was when any price appeared in the documents, and then the number of zeros told you that something somewhat strange was happening. And this was really frustrating. I was scared. I had a doctoral dissertation to write, and there was no material in the central archive of the Hamburg State. Then one day, I did a little social networking. I was having tea at the British consulate, and I met a delightful a elderly gentleman who listened to my lament and said, oh, well, you better come and look at my father's papers. And this was Eric Warburg, uh, son of Max Warburg, who had been in his heyday the most influential financier in the city of Hamburg. I went the next day to the Ferdinandstrasse. I was shown into his uh, father's old study where all his father's uh, files were still kept. And there it was. The story of the hyperinflation was, in fact, in the papers of the network of bankers who had watched this catastrophe unfold. It wasn't in the hierarchical archive at all. And the insight I, I take from that today is that the history of networks is just harder to write because the stuff, like the networks, is distributed. There's not a central archive of the German Jewish financial elite. That doesn't exist. And yet the German Jewish financial elite was hugely important in the 19th and 20th centuries. If you want to write that history, you have to go one bank at a time, one family at a time, and laboriously assemble it. Uh, so it's harder. And I think that's why social networks have played too small a role in mainstream historical narratives. It's just difficult to do. That's great. Um, so you tell your story, and as you say, you focus on the last 500 years, but it kind of, you talk about the Roman Empire and the spread of Christianity and Islam. Let's talk about um, what I think is one of the important events where, where you, you describe as an important event, where networks combined with technological innovation had an enormous impact in bringing down or flattening a hierarchy, and that was the Gutenberg Press and, and, and Luther. That's an important episode in the book because you, you think that's an important comparison point for modern times. The central analogy of the book, Jack, is the Reformation compared with our own time. 501 years ago, Martin Luther launches a campaign to reform the Roman Catholic Church. And you probably read in your high school textbook that he, he nailed his theses to the door of a church. If that had been the only communications technology available to Martin Luther, we would never have heard of him. He would have been taken out like the heretics of previous generations who hadn't really got past first base. The difference is that in 1517, there's already a large network of printing presses all across Germany. And Luther's message goes viral, is printed in multiple locations, uh, his sermons, uh, and theses uh, are published in extraordinary volumes. 
I mean, Luther dominates the, the content that is being produced by printing presses in the 15, early 1520s, and that's why the Reformation is possible. It was, I think, it would not have succeeded had it been done with the written word. There's a great uh, couple of papers by a guy named Dittmar, whom I cite in the book, who explicitly compares the impact of printing with the impact of the personal computer and the internet. And it's very striking that the price of communication follows a similar spectacular 99% decline, and the volume of information follows the same exponential growth. The only real difference is that everything happens 10 times faster in our time. But it's the same identical process. For me, the most striking insight is that, like many of the architects of the internet, Luther was an optimist who believed that if everybody could have access to scripture through printing, translation of the Bible into the vernacular, everybody could have a more direct relationship with God, not necessarily mediated by a corrupt clergy, and everything would be awesome. He didn't use exactly those words, but that was the basic <laughs> idea. Uh, he thought the priesthood of all believers, which the Bible talks about, might actually be achieved. What happened? Instead of that, there was the drastic polarization uh, of Reformation and Counter-Reformation. About half of Europe said, we agree with you, Martin, but you don't go far enough. And the other half said, you're a heretic. Let's burn these people. And Europe had about 130 years of conflict, some of it extraordinarily violent, on the issues that, re that Luther had, had raised. In our time, the analogy, I think, works quite well. Going back to the 1990s and, and John Perry Barlow's declaration of the independence of cyberspace, Silicon Valley has told us, when everybody is connected, everything will be awesome. And they did say that. They did say that everything would be awesome. And I've heard this ad nauseum. It, you still hear it when you uh, go and live in Northern California. A planet where everything is connected will be amazing will solve the world's problems. That was the message of Facebook until quite recently. That Mark Zuckerberg was going to build a global community. The analogy with the Reformation is that that was about as likely as Luther's priesthood of all believers. In just the same way as happened in the 16th century, what the internet has done, and this is especially true with the advent of the, the network platforms like Google and Facebook, is to create an engine for polarization. Wherever you look now, whether it's on Facebook or on Twitter, clusters of broadly liberal and conservative thinking have formed. And these clusters are becoming further apart and less in touch with one another. So I think we have a kind of secular equivalent of the Reformation in our time. And that, I think, is, is the, the most powerful analogy that yeah. the book has to offer. It's a brilliant analogy. But in the, in the, inter, in the end of chapter 9, you say, that um, when set in its proper context, the present time, and I think you're referring to the age of the internet, and I think the context is the Reformation, the, the present time appears less unnervingly unprecedented and more familiar. So I agree with that, and we'll talk about that, but I have to say that you reminded me how extraordinarily violent and destructive the, the Reformation was for 120 years, and do you think we are at the beginnings of something that's potentially equally as, as destructive? I think we should be more worried than we are yeah. in that the way in which our technology works is, is a little different. The, the printing press remained a distributed network. Gutenberg didn't control all the printing presses in Germany. There was actually no central control, really. Our network has become highly centralized because the network platforms have this winner-takes-all quality so that one monopoly after another emerges. Amazon in, in online retail, Google in online search, Facebook in online networks. Nothing like that happened in the age of the printing press. And these particular network uh, platforms are engines of polarization. They are set up to accentuate the existing divisions in our society. How come? Well, because they essentially direct information content to you, 
on the basis of what you have previously engaged with, as most of you will be aware, there is a, a filter bubble or echo chamber effect. It's like confirmation bias institutionalized. You will only hear more of what you already engaged with. That's inherent in the business model, by the way. As is, let me just add an, an, an emphasis for the extreme views to tend to, to, to Extreme to views as much as fake news right. uh, uh, proliferate in this, uh, in this setting. And one thing that's extremely interesting is the way in which that, that tendency for extreme views to proliferate works. There are a couple of ways it works. On Twitter, there's a nice paper that came out after the book that shows this. A tweet is on, on a political subject. A tweet on a political subject is 20% more likely to be retweeted for every one emotive or moral word that it uses. That's academic euphemism for strong language. That's why left-wing tweets always have the F word in them. Because the more strongly you express your view, the more likely it is to be retweeted. We also have the strange phenomenon of, of Google and YouTube search, which if you search for a topic, will not just give you more of the same as suggestions for where to go next. It will give you more extreme content on the same subject. So we've created engines that drive people out across the political spectrum, either to the left or the right. Last point, the lesson of the 16th and 17th century is that verbal violence is often the prelude to actual violence. We're at the verbal violence stage mostly right now, but I don't see anything in history to say we can't go further down the path towards actual violence, nor do I see anything in history to say that the process of polarization reaches some equilibrium point. If anything, I would say 19th century American history is a dire warning that what begins in the, la in the realm of language ends on the battlefield. So what worries me a little is that there is a sense in which this process of polarization can keep going. There's nothing to stop it. Nothing has changed in the way that the major network platforms operate. And I do worry that our politics has a record, American politics has a record, of going from the verbal to the actual violence. So yeah, I think we need to be more worried. And I think the reason I wrote the book and focused on the 16th and 17th century is that the scenario where arguments about transubstantiation and consubstantiation lead to massacres, that scenario should warn us that what can seem like an arcane dispute about hate speech, a favorite word of our time, is in practice a debate about heresy. The term hate speech is a substitute for heresy. And when one is accused, and I've been accused of this, of hate speech, you are being accused of heresy. And the secular reformation that I see going on in America today, and it's very visible on American campuses, troubles me. Because once people use this terminology, they have taken an, an important step away from civil discourse, away from what we're doing now, in the direction of something more like the duel. I couldn't agree more. It's a depressing insight, but I, I think it's absolutely right. The question, next question, I guess, is how should we think about what to do about it? And what are the relationship? How should the, I guess one question is how should the state, the hierarchical or, organization, think about addressing this problem? It's not just, as you talk about in the book, it's not just um, polarization, political polarization and Weapon, the weaponization of speech. It's also that these platforms allow um, fake news, as you say. They allow for things like the DN, the uh, they facilitate um, cross-border information operations. They exacerbate uh, economic inequality. There's a, there's a there's a fundamental critique of these platforms in the book, which is uh, outstanding. So those are a lot of different problems. Uh, Taking the most important of those, what sh how should we think about what to do about this? This goes a little beyond the book, but you give hints in the book. Yeah, the book does not have a whole bunch of policy yeah. prescriptions at the end, and that will probably cause some of the Washington crowd to, to want to leave immediately. Um, but here we are. I know you have this views. Morning, why don't you come up with something that's, that's ready to be legislated? The book deliberately doesn't go there, but there is clearly a, an implication. Right about the need for something to be done.
and if I can just say one more thing before you answer. There's also, I think, it, I don't think you're quite overt, but I think one of the implications is we need to think more about hierarchies. Is yeah. that fair? Right. So, so there, there's a, a critique that goes beyond what we've said so far. You touched on it briefly there, but it, it includes the problem that blatant untruths seem more likely to go viral than, than true statements. That's a major problem. In the Reformation, by the way, the theory that witches were amongst us went viral in the places that most enthusiastically embraced the Reformation, like my own country, Scotland, which burnt a great many witches. So crazy stuff going viral is another thing that history would lead you to expect, as also network science leads you, leads you to expect. You mentioned the inequality problem. Network economics, tremendously inegalitarian. Right. They magnify existing inequalities and make them a great deal and that's Great. a large difference with the Reformation. Which is a big difference. And that's because of the ownership. As I mentioned earlier, nobody really owned the printing press. There was no, Gutenberg actually went bankrupt at one point and ended his life on a state pension. There were no billionaires uh, produced by the printing press. Our network is owned by a tremendous uh, and small elite of very wealthy, mostly men. Uh, and this, um, this, this creates, I think, a fundamentally unstable, unsustainable state of affairs. 80% of news consumed in the United States today, 80, is, is referred to the user by either Google or Facebook. That is how most news is now consumed, via those platforms. 45% of Americans get their news from Facebook. That means that Facebook's newsfeed algorithm is the most powerful editor on the planet, second only to the Google search ranking. It seems to me that the public sphere has been transformed in a way that we are still struggling to comprehend. But the net effect has been to create, in someone like Mark Zuckerberg, a figure more powerful than William Randolph Hearst at the height of his power. What do we do? Facebook says, leave it to us. We will fix Facebook. Self-regulation is all you need. The left says, these are monopolies, and we need antitrust actions to break them up. And the right says, duh. I see no serious <laughs> engagement with this problem on the right. Which is amazing, because the companies I'm talking about skew so far left that they are essentially the campus translated into the realm of business. The politics of the campus, I hear this again and again from people in Silicon Valley, the politics of social justice, the politics of trigger warnings, of microaggressions, has migrated into the big technology companies, which is why James Damore was sacked from Google. So these companies that now dominate the public sphere and determine what news Americans see are almost entirely to the left of center. And not just a little bit to the left of center, quite a lot to the left of center. And conservatives are like, oh, we don't do regulation. We're conservatives. Don't say that word. I, I used the regulation word at the American Enterprise Institute World Forum at the weekend. Honestly, it was like taken out a clove of garlic at a convention of vampires. <laughs> but what the hell else are we going to do? I mean, you can do it a couple ways. And I think this is something we should try and talk about, Jay. And I'd love to get your thoughts on this, because in some ways, this is above my pay grade. Either you say to yourself, they're utilities, and our First Amendment rights are potentially threatened by them, in which case they need to be regulated in such a way as to maintain our First Amendment rights so that, for example, Dennis Prager's Prager University is not systematically discriminated against by the Google search algorithm, which it is. Because Google now has a lot of Prager University content marked as restricted, which means that anybody using the internet at a, a college or a high school may not be able to see it won't come up in the search results, because the restriction will prevent that. So there's that. And there's a case I gather underway about that specific issue right now in the California courts. Or, and this is the more wonkish piece, 
Do we look again at the exemption introduced in 1996 in what was then the Communications and Decency Act, Title 230 of which says, if you're a technology company, you have no liability for the content that appears on your platform. None. For me, this is just the anomaly of anomalies. It creates a completely non-level playing field in which content publishers are defined as such are liable for the content and any harm that arises from it. And the technology platforms who take that content are home free with almost no liability. My instinct, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, is that conservatives should not want to add to the power of a regulatory state. But they should want this to be settled in the courts. I don't like to give you lawyers more work, but it does seem to me that a world of litigation might change the ways in which Google and Facebook behave. Currently, they really don't have that much to fear from litigation. It's hard to get standing even to sue them. So my sense is that we as, as conservatives need to have a better answer to the question than we currently have. The left has its answer. It's a time-honored answer, antitrust. It's not going to work since the courts at the time of Bork said the test is consumer benefit. Right. You don't have a chance taking Jeff Bezos to court on antitrust. He's gonna, that's going to be the shortest case in American legal history. So we have to come up with something better. Because he's dropping, he's because, putting, putting because he'll laugh and say, by the test prices, of consumer right. welfare, right. Amazon is the best, best company ever. ever. And, the and Google, by the way, and Google will say we're giving things away for free. Exactly. So the antitrust uh, idea is a, is a non-starter, in my view. It won't get past first base in the courts. So I think we who, who think about these issues need to come up with something better. So the, status quo, the status quo is indefensible. Let me add a political sure. point. If we do nothing, the midterms are going to be worse than you already think, a lot worse. Because never again will the network platforms in Silicon Valley allow conservative candidates to use them as Donald Trump's campaign used them in 2016. The sound of heads exploding on November the 9th, 2016, was deafening in Northern California. They couldn't believe that Facebook advertising had been so vital to Trump's success, which it was. I don't think he would have become president without Facebook. As people think more and more about this, they will, I think, begin to grasp the power of the platforms. I think the Russia issue is a distraction from the real question, which is the power in our politics of Facebook, YouTube, and the rest. So we've got to come up with a better answer than self-regulation, because self-regulation, I think, means disaster for conservatives. Yes. Conservatives are simply going to be at a disadvantage. The algorithm is already, in some ways, skewed against far-right elements, for sure. But who decides? Who decides who is alt-right and doesn't belong in the public sphere? After Charlottesville, there were some pretty open admissions that Silicon Valley chief executives decide, and if they don't like the cut of your jib, goodbye. You'll be on page 10 of the search. And as you say, so I don't, I don't have some responses, but I don't have any answers. Um, the essential problem here is that this is speech, and the government has a very difficult time regulating speech, even in an economic context. And that's the first problem. I agree with you that antitrust is not a fruitful way to go. I don't think the public utility analogy works for a variety of reasons. They don't naturally fit into that. I'm not so sure. It's definitely the 230 exemption is, is under pressure. I think the, it's going to be under pressure first on things like child pornography and sort of things sex like trafficking. sex trafficking and things like that. And may, but I'm less confident than you that I mean, what are the harms that are going to be litigated if, there, if the 230 exemption narrows? <laughs> the essential problem for conservatives, I think, is that if you're going to rely on the government to protect your speech, you're not going to be... So I'm not, you know, Congress is pressuring the, 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 the social media firms, the platforms are now acting to try to clean up their act after the 2016 election. They're doing so because Congress pretty clearly in the hearings in December and January um, threatened them with regulation, even though Congress probably can't regulate. It lacks the, the constitutional power, among other things. So they are taking steps to clean up their own internal act where they can control the speech platform according to their rules of terms of service. But I agree it's not going in a direction that's going to be good for conservatives. Well, in fact, it's going the very worst, worst, worst direction. The worst direction, Because I agree. what happens is that our community standards 
is a very flexible uh, concept. Uh, you are not complying with our community standards, therefore out you go, or you get restricted. You know, the, the question of who decides on those community standards is much more important than we realize today. And it's kind of a black box. But if you drill down into what they've been doing since they said they were cleaning up their act, it includes consulting the Southern Poverty Law Center. Right. You know, can you believe that those shysters are still in business? <laughs> that the New Yorker is publishing articles praising their heroic work against the far right? It blows my mind. And it makes me furious. Because another Hoover fellow, my wife, Ayan Hersey Ali, is on the wrong side of this. The Southern Poverty Law Center has a list of, quote, anti-Muslim extremists. It doesn't have a list of Muslim extremists, by the way, the people who actually kill people. But it has a list of anti-Muslim extremists, and she's on it. So Google, or whoever it is, says, gee, we need to make sure that there's no hate speech on the platform. The Germans are giving us grief, and who knows, it may become a problem here. Better find out who the extremists are. Well, I just did computer science. I don't know. Who do you think we should call up? Let's Google it. Southern Poverty Law Center, call those guys. You see how this works? And pretty quickly, we have a very dangerous feedback loop in which Silicon Valley says, please tell us who should who is in violation of our community standards, consults the Southern Poverty Law Center, and bingo. People are being lumped in with the alt-right, the white supremacists indiscriminately because that's what the left does. So it's one possibility. I, again, I don't have any great solution, and I agree it's a serious problem. But on the other hand, as you point out in your book, and as you said a second ago, Donald Trump was enormously successful in using Facebook and Twitter to help him win the presidency. And as you talk about in your book, populism more generally has, at least in part, been driven by uh, robust social media. That suggests that conservatives can use these tools to their ends. And I'm, I'm wondering whether there's a self-correcting mechanism if these platforms become too overtly anti-conservative? And are these networks too entrenched to, for, for competitors to rise up? Or is there any kind of economic pressure that the conservative consumer users of these technologies can bring to bear? It's very difficult, because the, the network economics have a winner-takes-all character. And it's pretty tough to imagine a rival to Facebook getting anywhere. The network effects are very powerful. Metcalfe's law says the bigger the network is, the more valuable it is. And Facebook has two billion, more than 2 billion users now. You know, good luck with Hoover Facebook if we decide to set that up. It's not going to be easy to get to 2 billion. So I think there is a self-correction at work already. And it is the self-correction Silicon Valley is doing to make sure 2016 never happens again. So 2016 was a nightmare for them. I've heard it explicitly said, we're tweaking the algorithm so that never happens again. You can tweak the algorithm, I've also heard it said, so that Sean Hannity disappears from the newsfeed, even of conservative users. This is a mighty power that they wield. A number of former Facebook uh, people have been speaking out on this issue, and I think often very intelligently. One interesting recommendation is that the algorithm uh, should be visible. We should know what it is. It should not be secret. Uh, another is, of course, the issue of data portability, which the Europeans are pursuing this year. And by the way, while we sit on our hands, the Europeans are going to regulate these yeah. companies. Very, and, very, and they're in the midst. They've been doing so for a while, and they're getting... Yeah. There was another report today that the French had... I can't remember if it was an indictment or a civil suit, but for abusive commercial practices against three or four American internet firms. And, they've, and they're not shy about regulation. But it's not clear that that form of regulation is going to be helpful to the problem we've identified. No, yet. I don't think it is, because unfortunately what happens, as I alluded to earlier, is that the Germans have a broad def definition of hate speech. Their policy is to fine the Silicon Valley companies aggressively yep. if they don't police the internet on behalf of the German and government. And in fact, that regulation is a good chance it's going to have extraterritorial impact right. on Google. And that will definitely cut out a lot more conservative Exactly. Speech. So I, I find the direction of travel in Europe broadly wrong. Uh, data portability is the exception. But essentially, uh, and the British uh, government is in danger of doing this too. Essentially asking the network platforms, please could you censor the internet on our behalf and we'll fine you if you let any hate speech through? I mean, the incentives that are being created by that kind of, that kind of uh, legislation are horrible, in my view.
So going back a moment to the John Perry Barlow era, at the dawn of the internet, and, and you talk in your book about how Bill Clinton said that regulating the internet was like nailing Jello to the wall. He was in China when he said that, and the belief in the 1990s was that the network was going to take down authoritarian states. And there were times when things seemed precarious, and during the Arab Spring, at first it seemed like Twitter and Facebook were very consequential in promoting those revolutionary movements. From my perspective, it seems like in March of 2018 that that movement is failing and that authoritarian states are figuring out, you talk about China especially, are figuring out how to reverse engineer the technology to enhance their surveillance. They're using, China is insisting in a way the United States never will on access to back doors for encrypted information. China is, as you talk about, um, coming up with social scores for individuals. They're eliminating anonymity. They're going to have potentially perfect surveillance, perfect is too strong, extraordinary, unprecedented surveillance and control because of the network. And they've turned the network into a tool of control. Mm -hmm. I see that hierarchy winning that battle. I see, at least I see that's the direction it's going. And I see open society hierarchies losing that battle, precisely because we have free speech, we have a non-regulatory tradition. I see our strengths hurting us in, in response to the combination of the network and the new technologies. What do you think? I think what's happening in China is extraordinary and alarming to anyone who believes in individual freedom. Uh, Jack Ma of Alibaba fame said last October, I think, at a Communist Party conference that big data was the future of law and order in China. In future, he said, the ba bad guys won't even get to the square. And I thought, the square, <laughs> that's great. He's even talking about the square. But what does the square mean in China? There's only one square that anybody ever really is referring to. The alignment between big tech and the Communist Party is now perfect. Uh, Jack Ma is the junior partner of Xi Jinping, who is now emperor for life. No totalitarian regime in the 20th century could even dream of the, the knowledge that the Chinese government now has of its citizens. Chinese state mate spends more on domestic policing than on defense, and that's after substantial increases in its defense budget. Police are equipped in some cities with Google Glass type technology that allows them to do facial recognition searches on people they see in railway stations. This is an astonishing level of social control without precedent in history. And it means that the one party state has a new lease of life. Under these circumstances, dissent is almost impossible. The state can probably anticipate it before you even do it. As, Mac, as Jack Ma says, the bad guy gets picked up before he gets to the square. So I think we need to think very hard about this. It's less than 10 years since the, the idea that the internet was going to help democracy and topple tyrants. And that whole idea is in lying in the dust, I think, at this moment. Do I have an answer? Well, there's no obvious answer to the Chinese problem, but we need to recognize that a new variant of the Cold War is emerging. Yep. Uh, and the network platforms in Silicon Valley ha only have rivals in China. There are no European rivals. There are no rivals anywhere else. It's Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent versus Fang. So Bat versus Fang, as I say towards the what Fang is. So they... uh, I wouldn't dream of, of uttering an acronym without explaining it. Okay. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and you should probably add Apple, so Fang. The big American tech companies have no rivals other than the Chinese tech companies. And here's the last thought before we go to questions. I thought until recently that the Chinese tech companies would own China and the Great Firewall would keep out the American companies and the American companies would take the rest of the world. Wrong. I think in the race for the rest of the world, the Chinese tech companies have a pretty good chance of winning because they already have superior payment platforms, yeah. superior e-commerce uh, structures, which you can roll out in emerging markets far more readily than the American counterparts can. So watch this space. In the race for global dominance, I think BAT is going to give FANG a pretty good run for its money, which means all of this has a strategic dimension, ultimately. And again, I don't think people are giving that enough. I don't think there's any thought given to that.
Thank you. Let's open it up for questions. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Yes, sir. So my, um, my question is actually uh, rather technical and, and pointed, fairly so, though. Um, in figure 31, Henry Kissinger's network, mm. um, both this figure and the figure preceding it are based on memoirs, um, mentions in memoirs. And we've learned from citations what's cited is not always the best paper. Yeah. And so does this risk um, distorting the network? In other words, um, networks are dynamic and they evolve, and this seems to be only one snapshot. Could you speak to that, please? Well, this is a great question. For those of you wondering, uh, there's a little part of the book which uh, relates to my biography of Henry Kissinger. And I don't think I would have written this book were I not halfway through a biography of Henry Kissinger. I needed to pause and ask myself a very important question. What was the role of his network in his ascent from public intellectual to most powerful man in the world, which he pretty much was by 1973? So the book is kind of an interlude to understand the network science and think about network systematically. And I, I, I put in the middle of the book a little experiment to see if we can begin graphing Kissinger's network. The experiment's a kind of a quick and dirty experiment in which I take all the memoirs of anybody who served in the Nixon and Ford administrations, regardless of status. If they wrote a memoir, they're in the database. And we ask, looking, I won't go into the technicalities too much, but essentially we ask about the network in terms of who is mentioning whom who is figuring most prominently uh, in these memoirs? So we're reconstructing the network of those two administrations from the, the memoir literature. And what we can do is, and this is what the book does, uh, take a number of steps. First, we look at the network of Kissinger as, Kish as Kissinger sees it in his memoirs. Then we look at it as Nixon sees it in his. And then we do a few more complicated things to see how everybody collectively sees the network. Uh, and the, the ultimate chart tries to establish relative importance of individuals using measures like betweenness centrality. There's a really wonkish part to this. Trust me, network science is a fantastic way of understanding how social networks are structured and identifying who the most important person is in a network in terms of their relationships with everybody else. It's a really powerful tool. Uh, and I think establish, this establishes as an experiment pretty co co conclusively that Kissinger was, after Nixon, the most important person in the network of that, the political network of that time. Is this a finished product? No. This is like the first cut. Ultimately, what I need to do is to use the documents, not just the memoirs, but the documents to try to build the network, to identify who are the most important people in the network. And that will take much longer because that will involve a great deal more data. This is a first approximation. Last point, you're right. Any snapshot of a network is a little misleading because networks are not static. They are complex systems. They have emergent properties. The bigger they are, the more complex. And so when you look at a network like this, what you're really seeing is the network of power as remembered, which is not the same thing as the network of power as it was. And that distinction will be very clearly made in volume two. Does that, does that uh, bring the risk of anachronistic in terms of remembering this? Of course. Memoirs are, uh, as anybody knows who's, uh, who's written one, a really unreliable source. <laughs> but if you get everybody's memoirs, and it's you quite a correct. lot of people. You can correct. There is a, you know, you get a certain correction yeah, from the multiplicity exactly. of memoir sources. Ilder at George Mason University, formerly a senior fellow at Hoover. My question concerns the, the way in the book that you manage the, the tension between, well, in network science, I haven't read the book, by the way. Um, in network science, um, there's an emphasis on the, topography of the network as the synchronizing device or mechanism and the influence is determined by the how the network forms the, the structure of the network so I'm wondering how you you deal with the the question of the influence 
of prominent influential uh, uh, individuals or, or even technologies such as you mentioned, the printing press and the other influence. So how do you pair that with the notion that it's really ultimately the network that determines mm. the outcome? The book attempts to take as much literature as I could find that systematically applies network science to historical problems and synthesize it. When you uh, do that, you discover that the coverage is incredibly patchy. Some really important subjects haven't been touched at all. Nobody has done a network analysis of the rise of Hitler, for example. Our understanding of the rise of Hitler is stuck in around about the 1980s. But there's great work on the Enlightenment, the spread of Enlightenment ideas. We have a really good understanding of the Enlightenment network based on correspondence and publication. A lot of that work has been done at Stanford as well as at Oxford. There is a, one great paper on the American Revolution which helps me answer your question. And this is a paper that asks about the revolutionary network in Boston at, at the time of the revolution, looking at memberships of the key societies uh, and institutions of the time, including one Masonic Lodge. By analyzing the network structure, by an, analyzing the network's topography, its structure, it's possible to show that uh, that Paul Revere was a tremendously important figure by any measure of centrality, degree centrality, between the centrality. He's tremendously important. And so we can understand by using network analysis who really mattered versus who gets all the headlines in conventional narratives. One point which I think is important is Paul Revere owes his celebrity to a ride and a poem about a ride. But the network analysis shows that he's actually vitally important in the structure of the revolutionary network. The British should have arrested him. If I'd been around, I'd have recommended that at once. <laughs> <laughs> if you had the network analysis. <laughs> that, 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 that's what really caused the British Empire's ultimate decline and fall, a lack of network analysis. <laughs> but I, I, mean, I think, that the, to be serious, the, the book takes a, as many episodes as have been thoroughly done and tries to show that this is a powerful tool. I am now working on the Nazi network because I think there are a few more important things for us to understand than how a radical ideology goes viral. How a movement which is explicitly committed to violence can go from being a fringe movement to being completely dominant in an electoral landscape in an amazingly short space of time. We have a problem with radical ideologies in our time we can understand a lot more about the process if we only apply these tools to what seem like obviously huge topics. It's kind of a failure of the historical profession not to have done this. Same goes for the Bolsheviks. Yes, sir, in the back of the beard. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Croner from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I really loved your book, and I just wanted to ask you about the uh, comments you made on China near the end. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you that I think BAT is taking over most of the world, and the American tech companies, given European harshness to them as well, kind of receding here. Now, given your calls to regulate these platforms in some sort of way, to limit their influence, do you not think that presents a threat to allowing the Chinese companies to expand even more and encroach on American innovation? I think you're right that it's a strategic question. And the, if I were running Facebook, I would be pitching my defense in strategic terms. Mark Zuckerberg is very wedded to his cosmopolitan globalist worldview. He wants to identify Facebook as a global enterprise. I think that is not a smart strategy in this context. In the post-2016 context, he needs to be saying, we're an American company. And you, need, you the federal government, want us to succeed because there's the alternative, the Chinese. He wants to be able to say what's good for Facebook is good for the United States of America. That's the way to position yourself in a quasi-Cold War. But if you're going to make that claim plausibly, then I think Facebook has to say, and we believe in free speech. We, we believe in an open internet, because that is what the United States stands for. I think if the claim is to be plausible that the American companies are natural partners, 
of the free world, of the US government, then they have to be committed to free speech. And I don't think they are. And that's the, that's the problem. If they could say, there's the Chinese internet. Give, the, give your data to Alibaba. It's on Xi Jinping. It's in Xi Jinping's hard drive if he wants it. There's your Chinese internet. Censorship is guaranteed. And here's the alternative. A completely free internet. Yeah, there'll be offensive content on there. Deal with it. That should be our, that should be our approach. The problem, if I could just say that, I agree, but that was made a lot harder by the Snowden revelations because being an American company suddenly meant that, face, that the U.S. government had access to data from all over the world. And that, made that, hard, that makes that strategy a lot harder. Snowden was a, uh, a fatal blow for the relationship between the federal government and the technology companies. Exactly. And that's why the square and the tower in the American context are adversaries. I end the book, as you know, with the juxtaposition of the Facebook campus, which is the square, and Trump Tower. Yeah. Uh, I think the conflict between these two entities is probably in an early inning. Yeah. Uh, and the Chinese situation is just the opposite. Thank you. Bob Shadler, the discussion is rather frightening and reminds me of a comment a couple of years ago um, at a Christmas party that we are not a police state, but the technology of a police state is in place. I would like to ask a more optimistic question more directly to your book. Uh, in researching what a family firm is, I'm wondering if it would be something like being at the sweet spot between tower and square. Because a family firm we know is different, and we don't really have a handle on a theory to apply to it. And it seems it has these qualities. I'd just like your reaction. This is an important question, especially as a family firm is now running the United States of America. Uh, I. Um, I have done a lot of work on this uh, earlier in my career when I wrote the history of, course, of the yeah. Rothschild Bank. And I also wrote a, about the Warburgs, two very successful financial uh, dynasties. And I think it's true to say that in the 19th century, uh, the family firm could combine uh, the best elements of a network structure with a fundamental generational hierarchy. And both these firms did not have a simple patriarchal structure, it tended to be the smartest son emerges as the dominant partner. Uh, but that model only works if there are lots of sons, not to mention daughters. Uh, the family firm really requires people to have 10 children. Uh, in the case of Meyer Amschel Rothschild, 10 uh, divided between five boys, five girls, and the five boys included two very smart uh, boys. If you only have the one son and the one daughter, as uh, Sigmund Warburg did, the system doesn't work, because unless you're incredibly lucky, that one son won't be remotely like you, won't be an heir. So I think the family firm has no real viability over any length of time in the era of the nuclear family. And that's why family firms now are short-lived uh, and can never really replicate the achievements of, uh, of the Rothschilds. The only way around that is to, like Donald Trump, have lots of children. Uh, he's, in that sense, rather a 19th century figure. And as I mentioned, now that the Trump Organization runs the United States, an extraordinarily interesting experiment uh, is, is underway, the outcome of which none of us can predict. That's not fair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. Really appreciate it.